In this episode of the Backpacking Light podcast, we turn our author spotlight on longtime contributor Drew Smith and chat about the PCT, climate change, ponchos, freeze drying, and more. Look for me in the mountains where walking has a way of pulling you to your peace of mind. Welcome to the Backpacking Light Podcast. I'm Andrew Marshall. This episode is an author spotlight where we sit down for in-depth, rambling conversations with some of the writers that make Backpacking Light such a great place to experience gear, skills, trips, and backpacking culture. Today's interview is with Drew Smith. If you're a reader of the website, you may know Drew from his lovely stories about desert backpacking, or perhaps you've been reading his ongoing series about freeze drying. If you haven't read Drew's work, Make sure you check out the show notes to this episode, where we'll have links to the articles we talk about in this interview. Drew Smith grew up in Tucson and Southern California, and dabbled in long-distance hiking in his early 20s before picking it back up again later in life. He's got a lot of interesting things to say about deserts, gear, food, and how to craft a hiking story. Enjoy. Right, Drew. Welcome to the Backpacking Light podcast. Thanks for joining us. Well, thanks. I'm uh, glad to have a chance to talk with you. No. Oh. Um, so I was just counting up all the pieces you've written for us, and you've written in the last few years sixteen or seventeen pieces over a, a wide variety of topics. But I want to start with the one that we're publishing um, in the time of the podcast. We're publishing it tomorrow, so by the time listeners are listening to this, it will have been out for a week or so. And it's a piece about uh, a section of the PCT. So let's start there with you. Like, what is your relationship to the PCT? Huh. Well, uh, it, it goes back a pretty long way. So like I suspect many hikers of my generation, I was uh, inspired by Colin Fletcher's uh, books about hiking, you know, the thousand mile summer hiking the length of California. And having, um, as a teenager, uh, actually a preteen, hiked a section of the John Muir Trail. Uh, after I graduated from high school, my brother and I decided, well, we'll hike from um, uh, Walker Pass up to Lake Tahoe, about 500 miles. That was in 1976. So the PCT didn't actually really exist then. It was uh, the John Muir Trail and a bunch of Jeep roads and and a few things like that. But but uh, we, we hiked it for uh, a, a, few, a few days, and then unfortunately, I uh, uh, tore a cartilage in my knee, made it another 100 miles or so before I just mm -hmm. had to give up uh, and, and mm -hmm. bail out. And, you know, after that, uh, you know, a lot of things got in the way of uh, long distance hiking, you know, the big uh, commitment that it takes to take off a month to, to go do something like that, you know. I, decided I'd had enough of building sailboats uh, to make for making a living, went to college, uh, ended up going to graduate school, getting married, having kids, having a career in biotech. Uh, and uh, wasn't really till, uh, you know, after my kids had pretty much gone through college that I could say, well, sorry, I'm, I'm leaving for a month now. Uh, <laughs> gonna go hiking, uh, I'll see you in a month, uh, you know. Uh, and doing that sort of thing, you know, there's kind of a, and when you, you know, you're out on the trail, there's, there's definitely a, a, a bimodal distribution of ages. There's the kids right out of college, usually uh, in their early twenties, who don't really have, uh, you know, not, not too settled down and uh, are wisely taking advantage of their chance to do something really unusual if they'll remember the rest of their lives. And then there's the uh, empty nesters like me, people who've been wanting to do something like this for a long time, but really can't do it. Uh, you know, you can't take five months off to, uh, when you've got kids and a wife and a home and a dog. So, uh, uh, you know, the, I f fell into that latter demographic. And, uh, you know, of course, you've got to, <clears throat> you can't wait too long for that because you don't see a lot of 80 year olds out hiking the PCT. <laughs> There's kind of a you know limited window uh, when you're in your 50s and 60s that you realize mm -hmm. that uh, hey this is as strong as I'm ever going to be and if I don't do this now 
I won't ever do it. And kind of the last five years, my uh, decision on what trails to hike is basically based on what's the hardest route that I think I'm still physically capable of. Oh, and interesting. Doing, yeah. doing that. That's where a lot of these desert hikes come from because uh, the PCT is, you know, it is a challenge physically, but it's all on trail. It's not right. that big a challenge. Not if you're, you know, not if you're it, it, not new to backpacking. And if you start it pretty soon, you won't be new to backpacking. And by the time <laughs> right. you start at Mexico, you know, by the time you made it to Big Bear, you're actually a, a pretty experienced backpacker. Yeah, it's a very fast learning curve on the on the long trails. Um, I want to talk to you about the desert pieces in a second, but I want to dig into this piece that you wrote for us um, on this section of the PCT a little bit. What is it? What was it about this section or this hike that you felt like would make a good story? Um. Well, there there, there were a few. Mostly, it's the 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 observation of change that that's that's going on. Both the sociology of the trail uh, that uh, it, you know the trail sociology is an interesting uh, subject in its own right, and how mm -hmm. it changes over the years. And it just you know the last couple of years, the last couple of sections I've done in in Northern California have kind of been ground zero for the effects of of climate change in the wilderness. And, you know, it just, it doesn't, there's not a lot of subtlety about it. When you're hiking through smoke day after day, the trail gets closed. Uh, the heat is almost unbearable, uh, even at high altitudes. Uh, you can't ignore that. Um, you know, it pretty much just beats you over the head. And, and there's the, the, you know, again, just like with uh, the aging thing, I mean, it may not get any better than in fact, I think we're coming to an age where the, the the possibility of someone hiking from Mexico to Canada and covering all 26, 50 miles of the trail in one go, I don't know if that's ever going to be possible again. Certainly not routinely. It mm -hmm. would have to be an unusual year that didn't have a, a trail closure of some kind or another that, that pops up along the way. Um, yeah, the the photos from your story really struck out stuck out to me because I mean you you're going through some pretty iconic sections you you make it to Crater Lake in the story and and um so the contrast between those kind of iconic western photos when there wasn't smoke and then some of the photos of you hiking through this apocalyptic you know landscape with an N95 mask on it's just um it's really striking and and I'm sure it was mentally tough to kind of go through those variations in trail conditions, right? Yeah, I mean, because, you know, that was pretty much the opposite of fun doing that. Um, and so you have to ask yourself, why am I doing this? And by the time I got to Crater Lake, you know, a lot of people that hiked from Mexico were just saying, hey, I'm done. Uh, mm -hmm. this, this is this is terrible. Uh, you know, it's hot, there's long water carries, it's smoke every day, you can't see anything. Uh, and they, people were either saying, you know, I'm, I'm just going to go skip up to Washington or go go uh, go lounge in a, go, find a pool to lounge by and drink cool drinks for a couple of weeks because mm -hmm. uh, this just isn't working for me. And, you know, someone mm -hmm. who's like that far, you know, it's not like they're, you know, somebody who goes 100 miles says, yeah, okay, I don't think I'm going to do this. If you've made it to Crater Lake from Mexico, you were pretty committed to doing this, and yeah. and certainly physically capable. You're you're by definition an an elite hiker, uh, and so uh, seeing people drop out because it was just too gnarly was uh, was not good, you know. In your piece, uh, which is which I think we called hiking the PCT in a time of change or something similar to that. Um, there's a lot of subtext and a lot of um, sort of threads that you've woven through the narrative. And I, I think that that's a wonderful strength of yours as a writer. I always look forward to your trip narratives because I know that you're going to be telling a good story, but I also know that you've got a point. Like you're saying something, even if you don't say it right out loud, you're saying it 
uh, beautifully with the way that you are telling the story. And so I want to talk to you about your writing process. When you are out in the middle of a trip, do you are you putting the story together in your head of how you of how it's going to look on paper, or do you have to wait and let it marinate a little bit once you get home? Well, both of those things. I certainly, you know, take notes and write write a daily journal uh, that can be, mm. you know, usually a couple of hundred words, uh, longer or shorter, depending on what happened and uh, how beat I am at the end of the day. It takes. It's not always easy to convince myself that, uh, yeah, I need to not just go to sleep, but to stay up and write 300 words. But, you know, I don't know. I know from experience that you think, oh, yeah, I'll remember this, but you don't. Um, Hmm. And so, you you know, it doesn't take a lot of words, but you need a few prompts to remember, particularly to remember how you felt, which is, I think, the most important thing to try to capture, you know, what, what was it actually like and what was the, that experience like for you at that time in that place? Um, and, you know, ultimately that's all any writer can do is say, you know, what, not what they think they're supposed to uh, thought or have felt, but what they actually did, whether it's good or bad or silly, uh, you know, that's just uh, how it is, but, you know, from there, uh, you know, I, I, I try to outline things and, and give shape to them, and I almost never do that. Uh, I mean, I'll abandon it. Basically, I just start at the beginning and start writing, and wherever it ends up is where it ends up. Sometimes when I'm writing a trip narrative, um, I have an idea of the sequence of that I want to talk about the overall story I want to tell, but the themes sort of reveal themselves uh, as I'm writing, as yeah, opposed to kind of going in ahead of time. Would you, would you agree with that? Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I, with this story, I, one, I did start off with one theme in mind that, you know, I just suffered the loss of a, a dog that I really liked and mm-hmm. seeing her waste away and, and, you know, weekend was, there was a parallel there with what I was seeing with uh, the, the, you know, the countryside and the, 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 the landscape that I've known and, and, and loved for decades that uh, we're kind of losing that too. That's going away for us too. And uh, that those, uh, you know, I had to put her down the day before I left to go on the trail. So that was very much on my mind when I was walking. Uh, you know, that sense, that sense of loss. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure they're exactly parallel, but uh, to me it was. And so that's what I put in there. Yeah, it really spoke to me. I've only lived in the West for four or five years. Um, last year, we had the worst air quality in the world in, in my town yeah. for like a, a solid month and a half. And I came away from that experience pretty convinced that I can't live here anymore, you know, like, like, and I experienced that sense of mourning that you um, put in the words so well, because there's something for better or for worse, there's something so quintessentially American about this drive to go to be out West, you know, it's sort of it's sort of woven into our narrative again, whether that's just or not, or, or fair or not, it kind of is the way it is. And, um, sort of going back in the other direction, heading back East really struck me as a, as a loss. And so that's why I think that, that your story spoke to me so much. Yeah. I've lived in the West all my life, except for three years in Indiana. And two things struck me in that time there. One was that, uh, when it greened up in the spring, it looked fake because it was so green. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And and the other was that, that more subtly, it was that there was no out there. So, you know, I grew up in Tucson and Southern California, and I could always look out and see a mountain range, you know, and, and, you know, there was the city and then there was the beyond, you know, and a place that you could walk to and, and be out there. And, uh, You know, in Indiana, you can go, you know, southern Indiana, there are hills. But on the other side of that, there's just another town. 
Uh, there is no mm -hmm. out there. It's just more of the same. Uh, and and, and yeah, that's what, uh, yeah, kind of, uh, you, you know, the West has always kind of been for me is a place where uh, there's somewhere beyond that needs to be explored and to go find mine, mm -hmm. not just mm -hmm. more of the same over the hill. It's something different, mm. which is why my wife hates going on hikes with me because I always want to go over one more one more hill. <laughs> Uh, sometimes that's a useful trait to have if you're looking for a good campsite. Um, yeah. be because uh, what happens to me often is I will settle for good enough, and then the next morning, as I'm when I'm five minutes down the trail, there's the spectacular campsite that I was looking for. So I appreciate that uh, wonderlust that you have. Um, one last question about writing: what what drew it to you in the what drew you to writing in the first place? You've you've been writing a while, and you're pretty active on your blog too. Uh I, I don't know. So I, I um, my two interests when I was growing up were ambitions to be either a writer or a scientist. Uh, and so I ended up, uh, although intending to major in English in college, ended up in biology and becoming a professional scientist. Uh, and, you know, after a while, I kind of just went back to something I've always been interested in. Just like words and uh, like uh, uh, like like to uh, you know convey what an experience is like. That's mm -hmm. that's something that I in my own reading that's what draws me into a book is you know give something that gives me a sense of what it's like to be another person or live at another time or live in another place. Yeah, I want to talk to you about one what what your. Um inspirations are as a writer like what if if you were like what's your desert island nonfiction adventure book i guess is, is would be one question and then two you talk about the hero's journey on your blog you have a link to the wikipedia page for the hero's journey and uh, i want to ask you if if that is a concept that you sort of is central to how you structure stories i would say it's essential in the sense that i try to avoid it um because uh, that's that's kind of like a, a lazy trope. I mean, yeah, you got to tell stories, but stories are also mind hacks because they they fool you. People like them because they're easy to understand, but they also are misleading because the world isn't actually a succession of stories. It's just a succession of things that happen. There's no mm. beginning. There's no middle. There's no end. Stuff just happens. Uh, and so something that has a structure like the hero's journey is, I think, basically dishonest, uh, even though it works with how human brains work. For whatever reasons, there are certain uh, pathways that our brains naturally fall into and, and narrative stories with a beginning, middle, and an end with some conflict in between and a resolution at the end. That's intrinsically satisfying to our brains, but that doesn't mean that's how reality is. So mm. you got to have some uh, narrative elements in writing. Otherwise, you lose people's interest. You can't just write down random things that happen. Although, I guess James Joyce did that, and he's considered. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but, but for the, for the most part, you know, most people don't have the commitment to read, read James Joyce. Certainly. <laughs> right. It's something that's always on my phone, and I always think I'm going to read while I'm out hiking. You have a lot of time, and I never get very far on it. But uh, yeah, so so again, it's about being honest and not pretending that things are wrap up in a neat bundle, but also putting in smaller stories. Because some, you know, if, if you take a, a, a closer look and telescope down, then then sometimes there are things that really are stories. And can be mm. can be amusing. And your and your desert island nonfiction adventure story? Huh. I don't know. Uh, well, you know, somebody I, 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 who's you know the best writing about hiking I've seen is from Carrot Quinn. I don't know if you're familiar with her book, uh, which the name of which is escaping me right now. All right. Well, we'll look it up and put it in the show notes for sure. Um, but so, what do you yeah. like about what do you like about her? 
um, that that uh, she's uh, just you know first of all turns a good phrase uh, and is uh, honest uh, and and vulnerable and not pretending to be conquering the wilderness. I guess those are the types mm -hmm. of uh, any any kind of conquest type of uh, mm -hmm. theme in 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 writing about hiking. Certainly in writing of almost any kind is just a, a huge turnoff for me. Mm -hmm. We're not we're not here to conquer the world. We're part of it. Uh, you know the idea that that humans are separate from nature and that we're conquering anything is an idiocy. Uh, the only thing we're we're doing is kidding ourselves. Yeah, I fully agree with that. Um, this is a good transition into talking about your desert hikes. I feel. Um, I think in reading your your narratives on desert hiking, you have a really deep connection to the desert that sort of shines through and I was wondering if if you think that's a factor of growing up in Tucson and later Southern California or if that's something that you've kind of um, developed and discovered later in your life I know it's totally a factor of where where I grew up so uh, in the 1950s and 60s Tucson was a small city still um, and we lived on the northern edge of it, uh, where it was all dirt roads, a uh, quarter mile from our house. And my mother, you know, this was before helicopter parenting. My mother thought nothing of letting small children run around the desert all day long because she knew we'd be back in time for supper. Uh, and so, uh, you know, that's what we did. We, um, after school and on weekends and even in the heat of the summer, because we didn't know any better, uh, <laughs> we would... Run, run around, find snakes, uh, uh, rocks, uh, and so that's just my kind of my comfort zone. And you know, certainly hiking the Arizona Trail or doing other hikes, being in that country, there's certain uh, I think things that get imprinted on your brain. And uh, you know, walking through Saguaro National Monument, my feeling was, you know, yeah, this is how the world is supposed to look. There's supposed to be mountains and saguaros. Uh, and it's supposed to be open and you should be able to see a long way. And, and, uh, that feeling of openness is, uh, is something that, uh, you know, I, uh, look for in any kind of fight that even in, in, uh, mountainous areas, I always prefer ridge top hiking to being down in a Canyon. Mm. Although of course, desert hikes inevitably involve canyons as well. <laughs> right. But, uh, there's something about being able to see the, the contours of the land around you, not uh, blocked off by forest, that just makes me feel more at home and comfortable. What are some really practical uh, tips or skills that you have picked up about desert hiking that um, could immediately level up like someone's desert hiking game? Boy, I don't know. Uh, it's kind of I've been doing this long enough. That I'm not sure what's what's not obvious. Uh, so having having a well, uh, bringing a comb along, a cheap pocket comb, is a good idea because you will inevitably get choyas stuck in your feet, and your first uh, you you think you can brush them off, but you can't. <laughs> you just get more thorns in your hand. Uh, and so having a, a pocket comb to, to pull choyas out of your shoes is pretty essential to hiking in the desert. Uh, and, you know, a fairly obvious one that I've only come to in uh, later years is an umbrella, um, mm -hmm. a sun umbrella, because uh, particularly in hiking in the Mojave Desert, you can go for long, long stretches without there being any shade whatsoever. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, as I get older, my ability to tolerate overheating gets less and less. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Sorry I'm not uh, coming up with too much of anything. No, that's great. I mean, I think if someone, uh, especially the comb thing, that's that's a, I'd never thought of that. What, do you have a um, model of sun umbrella that you particularly like? Uh, you know, I think they're all made by the same company. I know that, you know, I have a Golight one, but I'm pretty sure it was made by a company in Germany that 
they sold exactly the same thing on Amazon. And I think maybe Montbell or, or Gossamer Gear has a carbon fiber shaft one that's like a half an ounce lighter than the aluminum <laughs> right. shaft one. Right. Uh, right. That's, so I, I think, um, you know, anything that's not a complete piece of junk is perfectly fine. All right. Well, um, as we wrap up here, I want to ask you a few questions about Backpacking Light. How did you How did you find Backpacking Light? Huh. I'm not sure to tell you, tell you the truth. I've been, you know, reading it for I don't know a member for twelve or fifteen years. Uh, probably just. Uh, I mean, you guys have always done a fairly good job. I think of uh, of. Uh, coming up, uh, you know, fairly high up in, in search rankings. And so just uh, Googling various questions about lightweight this or that, uh, you know, I probably uh, linked on an article, thought, hey, you know, this isn't just uh, the usual, you know, most sites uh, that I won't mention, I guess, uh, basically just act as advertisers, you know, mm -hmm. they, they just write articles as, captions for advertisements. That's all they really are. Mm -hmm. um, whereas uh, people were actually digging in deep and, and uh, criticizing things and pointing out the flaws. And so it was something that uh, was reliable and trustworthy. And so I, I respect that and like being a part of it. And why do you write for Backpacking Light? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I guess uh, uh, I, 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 you know, with, with anything, if you have skills or knowledge, I mean, you know, if you're a human being and you know something or can help other people out, you're kind of obligated to do that. So, if you can do something that that helps other people out, then you should do it. Mm. I hope, hope that's what I'm doing. Mm. I love that. Well, is there anything that you wanted to talk about today that? I didn't ask you about? No, yeah, I mean, I could go on for, you know, I've been, took my first backpacking trip when I was in 1967. I could go on for a long time about how much the gear has changed and the wilderness has changed. Uh, so I, I can assure you the gear is a lot better now than it was uh, mm. in, in the late 1960s. But, uh, you know, the thing is, is that the uh, the mountains are still the mountains, even, you know, even with climate change, even with uh, the wild effect on the PCT, you know, it's still, you know, that that's the place where I feel at home is being uh, out on the trail with a, with a pack on my back. I, you know, I get out there and I can't think of any place that I'd really rather be. All right. Well, that's a perfect place to leave it, Drew. Thank you so much for joining us. We will put links to um, all of your pieces that we talked about in the show notes. And uh, thanks for writing for us. I always look forward to your pieces, and it's been a real treat to talk to you today. Great. Thanks, Andrew. Well, that's going to do it for this public version of the Backpacking Light podcast. If you'd like to hear more of my interview with Drew Smith, where we talk about the philosophy and unique challenges of tarp camping, his thoughts on ponchos versus rain jackets, stoves, ukuleles, and the lessons he's learned from six months of freeze drying. Head over to backpackinglight.com slash podcast to watch the full members-only version. If you aren't a member and you'd like to become one, visit backpackinglight.com slash membership. In addition to full podcast episodes, You'll get access to 20 years of archives and forums, full versions of our members-only articles, and access to a wide variety of useful courses and educational materials. The Backpacking Light podcast is advertising free thanks to the membership paid by Backpacking Light members. So if you're excited about this content and you want to support us, please consider a membership. You can download the show notes for this episode at backpackinglight.com podcast. And if you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a review. It really does help other people find the show. Thanks for listening to the Backpack in Light podcast. I'm Andrew Marshall. Happy trails, everybody. So I shoulder my backpack, walk away from the crowd.